Hello Horror Hounds, our chronological journey through the films of Dario Argento has brought us to Tenebre, or Tenebre. When author Peter Neal comes to Rome, he finds that a serial killer has started imitating the murders in his books, stuffing his victims' mouths with pages from his latest bestseller, Tenebre. Not content with killing beautiful women who he considers to be sinful, the killer also has plans to eventually kill Neil himself. Can Peter Neil solve these crimes and reveal the killer's identity before he becomes a victim of his own art? Take that, Jessica Fletcher. After the not-so-great reception of Inferno, Argento retreats back to his comfort base of the giallo, something we've seen him do before, after Five Days of Milan wasn't a success. He returned and gave us Profondo Rosso. Now he's back in his comfort zone with another giallo movie, but that doesn't mean he's repeating himself. Argento is often accused of making the same film, essentially the bird with the crystal plumage, over and over again. But really, with each successive film, he repositions the giallo movie and repositions himself in the context of the genre he helped to create. And with Tenebre, I think he achieves the pinnacle of metatextual commentary on the giallo as a form and feature and his place in it. Tenebrae got caught up in the shameful video nasties debacle in the UK and it was re-edited, butchered <laughs> and renamed as Unsane and presented to a US audience and met with a lukewarm response. It took some time before we could watch Tenebrae as Argento intended it and wouldn't you know it, as soon as we were able to watch the actual film he made, the reappraisals began. The look and feel of this movie instantly sets it at odds with his preceding three films, Inferno, Profondo Rosso and Suspiria. Argento completely stripped away the light and style of his previous supernatural films, which he could easily have fallen back on as a, a, a crutch and a safety zone. Most of Tenebri takes place in broad daylight and a kind of neon hazed, brightly lit nighttime. Tenebre, the title, may well mean darkness or shadows, but the title is self-consciously ironic. Not just referring to the title of Peter Neal's novel in the story, but also the darkness inside rather than the long night time of most horror movies. The brightness, the coldness and the detached nature of Tenebre. Think of uh, Lecter's cell in Michael Mann's Manhunter compared to the dark, dripping gothic dungeon of Silence of the Lambs and you'll, you'll be on your way to understanding the feel of uh, Tenebre is expressed in the architecture as well, which is austere, angular and sparse. Argento has sought out uh, modernist buildings, brutalist architecture, hinting at the near future setting that Argento sometimes talked about in regards to Tenebre's setting. He posited a near future following some unnamed catastrophe that radically reduced the global population, where airy quasi-futuristic cities were sparsely populated and those who remained were almost all uniformly rich. The film perhaps elliptically alludes to that futuristic setting without ever confirming it outright. And Perhaps this future setting was just a mental hook that Argento found it useful to hang the film on in his own mind whilst he was making it. It's certainly an interesting perspective, but not one that I think is vital to enjoying or understanding the film. However, ultra-modern decor fills the interiors of these hard-edged and empty locations, clearly demarking that this is a different Rome than the one we're used to seeing on film. To my mind, it shares a kind of retro future that films like David Cronenberg's Shivers inhabits. Talking about previous Argento films, we've already discussed how he likes to highlight the artificiality of films. He's happy for us to understand that his stories take place in a heightened and fictional reality, like a stage play or a magic trick. In Tenebra, he goes even further. This film is archly self-conscious and self-reflexive. This isn't a surprise when you consider the real-life events that acted as inspiration for the script. The seeds of the story were sown when Argento and Daria Nicolodi were on the press circuit in America promoting Suspiria, and 
it was in this setting, uh, probably reflected in Neil's press junkets and rounds of interviews for his fictional book, Intenebre, that Argento himself was confronted most starkly with accusations of misogyny and the glorification of violence that he has his character accused of in the film. Later, whilst staying in New York and working on the script for Inferno, a fan discovered what hotel Argento was staying at and kept calling him every night. The calls became weirder and weirder, eventually culminating in the promise that the fan was going to murder Argento. Tenebre is a film with things to say, not just people to kill. Aside from being a groovy, bonkers and bloody giallo, Tenebre is a film that knows it's being made by Dario Argento. It knows how many cheap and gaudy knockoffs flooded the market after the previous successes of its director, and it comments on them whilst also playfully answering some of the criticism Argento himself faced as a purveyor of horror and violence. All of this is done whilst tipping a hat to the literary antecedents of Tenebre, the likes of Agatha Christie, Arthur Conan Doyle, Mickey Splane, and Ed McBain, all who influenced Dario Argento, not just for this film, but his entire giallo crime career. As a writer of violent thrillers, the character of Peter Neal faces accusations of misogyny and the glorification of violence and acts at times as a proxy for Argento. Certainly he also gets to answer some of those criticisms, but the answers aren't necessarily as clear-cut as you might imagine. They're knotty and multifaceted. And what's more, Argento knows this. It's intentional. There's a thick streak of dark humour that runs through Tenebre on a metatextual level, and Argento is having fun. Nowadays, we would say he was trolling his critics. This playful approach is no more evident than with the representation of homosexuality, a theme that we've touched upon when talking about the bird with the crystal plumage, cat and nine tails, four flies on grey velvet, and profondo rosso. It's a theme that fascinates Argento. In Tenebre, a prominent lesbian bisexual female couple are brutally murdered by a puritanical killer who deems them to be filthy, slimy perverts, quote. Their introduction and the scenes showing their home life and murder are lurid, bloody and titillating. The nudity is so brazen that Argento seems to be saying, is this what you want? Is this the kind of giallo that you're after? Beautiful naked women being killed. Is this all I am to you? There are flashbacks in the film that seem to hint at the psychology of the killer. A beautiful woman on a beach surrounded by four or five semi-naked men. She's seducing them all, bearing her breasts, seemingly about to initiate an orgy. Then she singles out one unidentified young man for a beating and humiliation as she fetishistically drives the heel of her red shoe into his mouth. We never find out if this is a genuine memory or a ritualized fantasy which perhaps drives the killer. What's interesting is that the woman on the beach is played by Eva Robbins, at the time a preoperative transsexual actress. This nameless, idealized woman who perhaps only exists in the mind of a madman is the ultimate totem of Argento's fascination with representations of sexuality, gender fluidity, and gender confusion. The music again will get in your head and rattle around your skull for days. I can personally attest to this. Not officially a goblin score because it was created by three of the four members of the band. Uh, it's Disco-infused nature might not be to everyone's taste, but the main theme shot through with Claudio Simonetti on a vocoder singing power, power, power over and over again, fear, 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 in a pulsing, descending scale, always rams itself into my head to the point where I feel like I need to take a drill to it to let it back out. So in summation, the cold and distant nature of the film, which does feel like it's trying to keep you at arm's length for quite a lot of the time, might make it difficult for the first time viewer to get into it, to be comfortable with it. But by the time you get to the Grand Guignol ending, if the reveal has worked for you, if the, if the magic trick does the business, you will go jeepers. You will want to see the film again to see how the trick's done. Like watching The Prestige a second time round, Christopher Nolan's film. When you watch Tenebre a second time round, you go, my God, it's so bloody obvious. And then you can really enjoy 
the cogs and parts of the film, I think. The context of the film within the rest of Argento's canon to date does make it more enjoyable for me on a metatextual level, I won't lie. But as a film, just in its own right, taken on its own, it's confident, brash, bloody. It's like nothing else you'll have ever seen, even in Argento's previous work. Even if on the surface, it seems like the same old, same old, oh, uh, an artistic American creative type comes to Rome and gets embroiled in a murder mystery serial killer plot. It is that, but as you expect with Argento when he's on top form, and he really is here, it's so, so much more. Hopefully you'll join me in the next video, which is Dario Argento's next film, Phenomena, which is, well,